NCDA, this is, this is the, the report that you'll get for free or for $5 from NCDA. Um, and it will give you a soil pH. So my front lawn soil is actually pretty acidic. So adding something alkaline is gonna help out quite a bit. It's gonna help the grass grow. And they give me direct applications for putting on agricultural lime. They say, put on 15 pounds per thousand square feet. And this is my, uh, my nutrient analysis. Very high in potassium, off the charts. So I need to be real careful about adding more potassium to my soil. Phosphorus is just like, you know, on the other end of the spectrum. That's why I'm gonna add that soft rock phosphate at the same time. Here's what I'm gonna do. Looking at my stove ash sample, I sent a sample in at the same time that I sent the uh, regular stove ash sample. I sent one in of a sample that I had already passed water through, right? So I passed water through it once and I got what is soluble out of it. At least I thought I got what is soluble out of it. And you can see there's still quite a bit of potassium left behind. Okay, so it's still, it's 2.8% potassium now. I think it was somewhere around five before. So I got roughly half the potassium out on the first soak. And calcium actually went up just, you know, by nature of other things going out. And then they give you the calcium carbonate equivalent. Calcium carbonate is your agricultural lime or it's straight lime. Agricultural lime has some magnesium mixed in with it. And then this is the agricultural lime equivalent. So if they're recommending that I put out 15 pounds per thousand square feet, I'm gonna multiply that 15 by 1.07 to get my um, equivalent in terms of liming effect on the soil. So if my front lawn is 1,500 square feet, then I'm gonna, um, add another factor of 1.5. So 15 times 1.5, uh, if I was to add straight agricultural lime, I would put 22 and a half pounds. Um, but since I'm putting in wood ash, I'm gonna put in 24 pounds of the previously rinsed ash. Now what's really important here is that um, if I'm gonna weigh it, that I don't weigh the moisture at the same time, right? So you gotta, you have to remove the moisture. But um, you can kind of get a ballpark here you can say, I mean, really the difference between 22 pounds, 24 pounds, pretty negligible. I was kind of surprised that I only leached out about half of the potassium. And I set up a few trials to see if I could do a little better than that. But first we need to talk about ash water. And this is really fundamental to everything else that we're gonna talk about tonight. All right, sodium hydroxide, uh, NaOH, that OH is your hydroxide, remember that? So it's hydroxide sodium salt and a potassium sodium salt sold as lye. This is not lye. You're going to get online and you're going to read about what do I do with my wood ashes and everybody's going to say you can make lye with it. This is an example of, of my uh, ash water, not lye, that I made by soaking ashes in something very simple like this. I put ashes in my bucket, um, measure them out if you want to, uh, in this case, I put in about a gallon of ashes, and then I put in about a gallon of water. And I stirred it up real good, and uh, let that water sit until it clarifies on top, and then I punch little tiny holes in the bottom of it. And then you're just gonna let that sit for one day, maybe three days, and you're gonna let it just drip out until the water um, really just stops dripping. That stuff that comes out is ash water. That's what we're calling it. I'm not gonna call it lye. And um, that ash water can do a number of different things. It can later be concentrated. So it's gonna come out pretty, pretty weak, still strong enough to burn your eyes. So you always need to be wearing glasses when working with this stuff. Uh, this has been concentrated from uh, what was roughly very um, slightly more than one gram per milliliter. So one gram per milliliter is, is pure water. So this was slightly more than pure water and um, got concentrated down to 1.1 grams per milliliter. <coughs> I don't remember what concentrate this is. This is probably around one gallon reduced to a quart, okay? This is getting strong enough to start doing things with. If I was to take that and boil it down completely, then I'm gonna end up with this. That is potash. It's a very impure potash, but uh, potash nonetheless, with some other stuff mixed in. 
Um, that other stuff mixed in is some of those non-alkali salts. Um, we'll get into that if we got some time. Okay, um, so solubility increases with hot water. We know that, that salt water holds more salt if it's hot. Sugar water holds more sugar if it's hot. So you're going to get more of the soluble salts out of this if you preheat the water before passing it through. And um, a lot of sources, a lot of the old timers, say like Foxfire type sources online are going to tell you to, to set up stone and a layer of straw and filter your stuff as it comes through. I'd say forget it. There's no need to do that. I, d I did it both ways. And honestly, I think the, the ash water comes out darker um, if you add straw to it. I don't think that's helping at all. Yeah? If that came from that bucket with the hole in the bottom, I would expect a lot more sediment in there. So did you clarify somehow? It's just a really small hole. Just big enough for a drop to go through. Okay. Yeah, so there are methods for clarifying there. Um, one of them is just, um, oh, here's the example of uh, two different ashes here, too. This is talking about the, I should have put this on earlier when I was talking about the carbon content of the uh, ashes. That's just to kind of show you the, the strong difference here between what you can get when you um, go through this process. This process is called, uh, and it's, it's written on your paper, um, lixiviate, I think is how you would say that word. That would be the, uh, I think, the, the chemical engineer's term for what we're doing here, taking a solid and removing the, uh, the soluble, solubles out of that solid mix. So again, let me recap here. Keep it simple. You don't need to do a complicated straw filter or anything like that. I have not seen any benefits from that in my work. Does that process make sense to everybody? It's kind of, kind of fundamental for this. One What's thing that? I wonder about is the interaction of the salts with the plastic. And what, are you pulling anything from the plastic out while you're doing this? I think you're pretty good. You know, HTPE is pretty benign. Um, there's definitely some plastics you can use. Uh, I mentioned that earlier. Uh, number two is going to be your best plastic for this. Um, polypropylene is going to be okay. I would generally stick, uh, stay away from the other ones. Um, and you want your container to be, uh, again, stainless steel or the um, enamel coated iron. Stay away from that aluminum pot. Just don't forget about it. Um, if you don't know, the, if you can't tell the difference between aluminum pot and stainless, aluminum pots are going to scratch really easily. And they're, they're going to feel really lightweight, too. That is potash. It's as it's, it's simple as that. It's taking that lye water and boiling it down to, to crystals. Interestingly, when I first did this with my really high organic ash water, it, um, it, it really smelled terrible. Um, like, smelled really bad. When I did it with my more pure stuff that I've been collecting lately, it, it kind of has a nice, like, almost vanilla aroma to it. Still nothing you want to be sticking your nose over, though. Okay, so, like, stay downwind of it. Uh, wear a mask if you need to when doing this. Do it outside. Um, I've got a little gas stove that I use for um, those kind of things. And we got little biochar producing stoves, too, that are nice for this. I'll talk about refining potash here in a second. But um, going back to that... Uh, uh, sample that I had sent to the lab where it said that I still had about four and a half percent um, potassium left over. I wanted to see um, how effective I could be at getting that potassium out through multiple soaks on the same ash. So uh, I set up this bucket right here and I put in, um, okay, three quarts, a little less than a gallon of old ash and then three quarts of distilled water and um, drilled some little tiny holes and it drained in about 24 hours and then um, kept samples of each water. This is the water from the first one, okay? And it gets subsequently a little bit lighter each time I add it. So that water is gonna get, when you start to boil it down, it's gonna start to get a little bit darker in color, right? Um, pH was 11.2 the first time I did it and it slowly starts to taper off, right? The, uh, interestingly, the density was quite a bit higher on the first time I did it. And then the second time, measuring density, I got um, basically the same density as pure water. I boiled down each one of those samples independently of the other. The first time, I got about, um, out of one quart, I got uh, 41 grams of potash. 
Out of another card, the second time I got 21 grams. And the third time I got 12. So you're kind of seeing a trend here. It's starting to dip off. Depending on what you're trying to do, um, it may be worth it to boil down and get extra potash. Kind of depending on how much ash you're generating. You know, if you just got a little campfire and you want to play around with ash, you know, you want to be leaching as much potash out as you can. But um, here's the number that, that we want to see. The total expected yield, say that I took all of that water that I collected and boiled it all down, I should expect about 122 grams of this solid, impure potash. Um, remember, we were saying that ash water should be about 5 to 10 percent. Mine was measured at about 5. And it's, this material is about 10 percent of the parent material, right? So that's telling me that it's about five percent or half not potash. Does that make sense? That's kind of a mouthful of, of, of figures there. So it's telling me that my stuff's quite a bit impure. It's also telling me that I should expect about 10% of my ash to be soluble materials, OK? After soaking it three times. And that I should expect about 5% of my ash the first time. How do we refine it? Caveman Chemistry talks a lot about refining potash. It's, he's got a really nice way of talking about it. Um, and you do want to refine it before you start using it in food products. Take a look at this solubility chart. This comes out of, out of his book. These are the six salts that you should expect to see in your ash water. You, and, and as we've proven with the green water, you're going to see quite a bit more. These are, are the six main ones. Um, potassium carbonate is, is your big player. Calcium chloride, sodium chloride, potassium chloride, sodium carbonate, calcium carbonate. And um, potassium carbonate is the only one here that's, that we're calling potash. It's the only one that we want. If we're trying to remove all these other ones, then we can uh, first um, let the ash water settle and decant off anything that is um, still soluble. So all of those solids that fall to the bottom of just your regular ash water, like you were talking about, then you're gonna, you can remove those solids by you know, basically pulling the, the liquid off. Um, boil that water. Until, and then, uh, until it's about half of your water. And by doing that, your chlorides are going to drop out. Okay? Notice your solubility here. Potassium carbonate is about twice as soluble as calcium chloride. Okay? So just by removing half of the water, a lot of this stuff should start to drop out, right? After cooling, notice the difference here at sodium carbonate. See how much more soluble it is when you heat the water up? versus this. It's one of the least soluble with cold water, but it's one of the most soluble with hot water. OK, so that stuff is still going to be soluble if you boil it. Um, you can basically, you're just going to let it cool off at that point, And your sodium carbonate will fall down to the bottom, at which point you can pull the liquid portion off, boil that down to powder, and then you've got pure potash, right? So that would be the process that um, our, uh, you know, say in colonial times, that they would have been using to produce food grade um, potassium carbonate that was referred to as pearl ash at the time. Um, potassium carbonate, interestingly, Pat, you may have something to add to this too. It, I, and I just learned this, it's really common in a lot of German baking. Yeah, it's, it's an alternative to sodium carbonate. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's well, arguably it's better for you, you know? and I want to know how to make it because it's available all the time. I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I heat up both my houses with wood, so. Yeah, you know what we should do is all gather our wood stove ashes again this winter and just do this on a much larger scale. Um, get the big 40-gallon stainless pot going and we'll just, uh, we'll, we'll boil out a lot of it. Um, Again, the book um, that I just came across here at the very last minute, um, How to Bake Without Baking Powder, has some really interesting uh, pearl ash um, substitutes, recipes that are based off of old colonial recipes. She went back and dug through old cookbooks from the 1700s, and a lot of them refer to using uh, potassium carbonate. Um, you really do want to get it nice and pure, though. You're going to get those really kind of soapy off flavors.
soapy? Soapy, yeah. It, by the way, also is an important fungicide for powdery mildew and bunch of mildew. Yeah, yeah, pure potash is definitely going to have some garden applications. Yeah, definitely. Um, here's something. You guys have already seen this. I kind of butchered it the first time I talked about it. This is how we're getting into um, carbonates forming hydroxides and how we're getting our alkali water when we add wood ash to water and why it turns alkaline. Um, in stronger acid solutions, those uh, bicarbonates that we created by adding carbonate to an, an acid water are going to bond with extra hydrogens and they're going to form carbonic acid. Okay? Carbonic acid is going to decompose into carbon dioxide and water, and that's what's happening with your baking powder. Okay, that's how you get, that's how your bread is rising as you, as you cook it. And I think you hit what, you basically hit a threshold temperature, and that breaks down. Um, that's why baking powders, um, off-the-shelf baking powders, are going to include an acid element and then an alkaline element. If you want to just use baking soda, then you've got to come up with your own acid. Um, if you're going to use potash, then you need to be trying to maybe, maybe start by following a recipe. Make sure you got your acid element there, or you're going to end up with biscuits that taste like soap. <laughs>